Hey guys, and welcome to the Final Phase Podcast. Most of our guests have been from the PUBG world, and that is normal to expect since I'm mostly involved in that game, but today we're going to have an expert on CSGO, someone who's also a fellow Croat and a good friend of mine, Professor AK Prof. He works for the biggest site in CSGO, HLTV, and he has a lot to share about his career, how to succeed in esport business, and of course, CSGO. Let's jump right in. There we go, guys. Prof is here, senior writer at HLTV. Uh, if you're into Counter-Strike, you obviously know who Prof is. He writes a lot of great articles and uh, does a lot of interviews at events. How are you doing, man? Uh, doing well. A bit sleepy, a bit tired, I think you can see. But uh, other than that, it's uh, pretty good. Just I was at the, there was the Rainbow Six tournament in Split mm -hmm. last night. So I went over there. It was like the after party. But it wasn't oh, yeah. really a party. It was more like a hang hang around. So met a few new people and seen like the old faces that that do things in Croatia, which was pretty nice. Yeah. So yeah, doing well. So you just went for the party, not to the event itself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to go, but just like work and you know how it is. CS events are on nonstop, so I really couldn't make the time to go there during the event. Yeah, but yeah, and it ended pretty pretty early. Like I, I planned to go on the final day, and it ended about like five p.m. or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, this is too early. I, I'm not, I'm not ready. So it's like, oh, the after party's at nine. So I just went yeah. to the after party. I mean, after parties are are the better part anyway. That's like during the event, everyone just talk. I mean, working on their things that they're working on, so they don't really want to go and just like mess with their job and like talk to people for like half an hour when they yeah. need to do something else so the after parties are are the place where you can actually just like have a conversation and catch up and stuff like that exactly which exactly. is which is pretty nice so uh, let's start from the usual question uh, how did you get into esports and when uh, uh, kind of late honestly uh, just because i've been playing games for a super long time but like competitive gaming as in esports as in something on a global scale was not something that i was really aware that existed until maybe like 2013 something something along those lines uh and that was for years i've been playing like i played some other tournament before even on clan base and stuff like that but like i didn't know that people are actually like, doing this for a living you know mm -hmm. there uh, and at the time there weren't a lot of people that were doing it right but uh, i think i was just playing cs with friends for a long time and then csgo came out and then we bought it because there was like, it was like a super, super sale or something. So we bought like 10 CSGOs and we just started playing and we found out about like competitive. Oh, we were like, okay, what, what is this? So, and then that is the first time I actually played like CS in like a five on five real competitive rule set and found out about the ladders and the ranks and all of that thing, all of those things. And I think in the game, there are a couple of links to like some, some matches or some something like that and then i discovered like okay nip is playing very games at the time so i watched that like what is this like why is some guy talking about people playing a game so the and then that's how kind of how it started like my interest in in esports okay interesting so for someone that is really involved today you started really late i've, I've never spoken to anyone yet that that hasn't you know been following at least something uh so that's that's pretty cool i think uh yeah you really I, I, got I, caught by yeah. it yeah at the same time i kind of when i got interested in i think this is a thing i just do as a person i just get super invested so i went back and i read a lot about like 1.6 and source and mm -hmm. watched some games and stuff like that to, to understand the kind of the history of the game and about other esports as well so i kind of have a really good understanding of things that happened before for a person that didn't really watch it so i, I can kind of hang with people and people don't know that i'm kind of this this new uh so yeah i just fake it if, if you're not that it's just like no one want, no one likes the new guys right so, yeah but do, yeah. do you ever get that uh someone says oh you're the new guy you don't know anything about 1.6 you shouldn't talk about 1.6 and stuff like that <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't think people talk about 1.6 that much anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, I think I think I can. I, it doesn't happen that much, I think. All right. So tell us about your road into esports writing uh, or just running something esports related with CS Adria. That was that, that happened like kind of quick after that whole like getting into CS as understanding esports. I think it, within a year I started started like working doing stuff just on a local basis on 
I knew some people that knew people that used to run like cups and tournaments and w which ended up being Flegma, which is the guy that runs the Croatian esports scene almost nowadays <laughs> for CS, definitely. Uh, and he was like, yeah, yeah this, there's this website, but no one does anything on it. I was like, can I write some things? I, I don't know why I said, like, even asked, but I, I was always interested in writing things on the internet. I did, maybe that's the kind of the forum history because we're from that generation that used to do a lot of, like, just hanging on forums. And th yeah. that is a place where you can actually write long things. It's not Twitter, not Instagram, where you can put, like, one word. People used to write things just like, okay, a new game that comes out, you make a review and post it on a forum for, I don't know, 10 people to read, like stuff like that. Yeah. So I was like, okay, can I, can I write something? So maybe like activate this thing. This thing is like, okay, it just gave me the password. So I wrote like two, two news and then we got like the Facebook running. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'm going to figure out how this Facebook thing works. So I posted some site, started learning about posting on like news sites and then posting on, on Facebook, social media. And they're like, okay, there are no tournaments. So, so that that guy Flagma was also like, okay, let's let's start doing things. And ESL was, at the time, kind of also existing, but didn't do anything in the region. So he started doing like ESL cups. So I was like, he was the head admin. I I did like some admining, banning people, arguing with people. You know how admining cup is like that's always super fun. And just like that, it kind of started <laughs> started rolling. You know, and then we did like, okay, cups are super super cool but let's do like a online league so we did an online league put in like a, i don't know we had some friend of his that was like a sponsor gave us like 200 bucks for for the prize pool for the first online league so okay then you have an online league you need to have a stream so we're gonna stream we've got someone that has an internet that that can stream in croatia which wasn't super easy at the time so someone was streaming and then okay i'm gonna come up and start casting so i did some casting as well and then we put together a LAN, and that is, I think, when I met you, that was like 2015 when we did our first LAN. Yeah. And then we were kind of okay figuring out like formats for tournaments, uh, figuring out how to get sponsors. So I was just like emailing random people with like a sponsorship PowerPoint presentation, and some people actually gave us money. So that was also okay. We can do this as well. Did our first LAN, got people from like five countries in the region coming over. So I don't know, overall, just like everything just starts rolling. You, you get into it and then you get super excited that you can do one thing. And like, okay, maybe I can do this next thing. And it just kind of starts rolling and you do. What I did was like doing almost practically everything that you can do, I feel like, in, in esports, except like hosting servers and like actually building, like running servers. That's what I never did because Flegma was an expert in that. So I'm like, yeah. okay, this is, this is your part. I'm not going to touch touch any of that. Yeah, so whenever you get really involved in a small project, you basically uh, get to do everything or have to do everything uh, or almost everything. So I guess that was a good learning experience and uh, it kind of defined you and uh, you kind of found your way and what you want to do. So what happened next? What happened after CSA, Drew? So that was a thing that was, I don't know, it was, it was never th something that I thought of like, okay, this is going to be a career or anything because I was in college at the time. <clears throat> maybe maybe lost a year in college because of it <laughs> maybe not maybe like deteriorated some personal relationships like irreversibly who knows uh but yeah uh so yeah you just do it and then i think that at one point I obviously i went to college i finished it after some years and then you have to figure out what what you want to do in life and i don't think i was really thinking that i could do it full time at like as I was finishing, I was like, okay, there are a couple of jobs here and there, but I'll probably have to get like a normal job, which is like programming or doing something along those lines, which is what I studied. But I also sucked at uh, at the same time. So I wasn't really happy about the whole thing. But yeah, you finish and then I put, put together a CV and I start like emailing people just like for jobs, job openings. And at the time that I was just like, I had my CV super ready. I sent out like three already. I opened Twitter and it's like HLTV uh, job opening. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. Just for I the guys that it. don't know what HLTV is, could you give us a brief summary? Yeah, j just to g give a bit on that. It's just it's the biggest CS CSGO site and exists exists for like 15 years now or more mm -hmm. from not, uh, 2002. It just covers everything about CSGO news, uh, statistics, uh, schedules for for things. So that is more or less 
the the place everyone wants to work work at if not if you if you want to work in the media side of, of csgo that's like the go-to place mm -hmm. if you want to work at tournaments then it's like esl probably if you want to work in a team then you know the teams yeah same teams that are everywhere the biggest organizations so yeah when you see when i see that i'm like I, actually i was thinking about this last night i'm like i i was also sending like some CVs to like mostly like companies in Croatia that work like IT de development, game development, stuff like that. I also sent to some esports sites, like completely random esports sites that I, I don't know which they are. They probably don't exist now. But no one, no one replied. Like none of these esports sites replied at all. And so yeah. I was like, okay, I'll send in an email to HLTV. And they literally replied like maybe the next day. So when you think about it, it's super funny that I got to work at like the best place I could. And all of these like kind of shit places didn't even reply. And also ESL replied for like a internship position and I had a Skype call and I shit the bed completely. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was also fun. But thankfully HLTV didn't have like any interview. It was just like send in uh, like an example work and yeah, write an article on like some made up topic like JW joins NIP. Mm -hmm. And I even wrote that like super fast and super last minute and did like a super bad job. But I don't know. They 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 liked it. I got the like internship position and then just started like grinding hardcore and uh, pretty fast. Actually, became like a full time employee. All right, that's a great story. Who so who's behind the site success? What people are we talking about? So so it's three 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 main people right now. The three co owners and uh, it it was originally Martin uh, Martin Rosenbeck, but Martin on the forum and on the site, people know him just as Martin uh, from Denmark, uh, who came up kind of with the idea, made like the original concept, which was uh, like the name HLTV is like Half Life Television, which yeah. comes from the comes from the demo viewer or the live match viewer mode of yeah. CS one point six. Uh, so people, uh, yeah, before their streams, people, I just heard some noise <laughs> before their streams back in like 2002, people just needed to connect directly to a server to the, to watch it on HLTV. But you couldn't, if, if like me and you were playing and someone wanted to watch, how, how could you know the IP of the server? Like mm -hmm. you can't know that. So there, his idea was, okay, let's just make like a list of matches that are on and just connect the. We'll find out what's the IP. We'll talk to people and put the IP next to the name of the match. And that was the original idea, which now sounds super dumb, like because you have Twitch, you have Twitter, Facebook, and stuff like that. But at the time, you didn't have any of those. Obviously, you didn't have YouTube. You only had like IRC. So I guess they were getting the IP through IRC, talking to people, uh, putting it on the site, and people just went to hltv.org, find the IP, and connect, went into the game, put in the IP, and watched. So. Yeah. That's that's original idea, and then uh, Pear Nomad is the nickname. He's the, like the main developer. He came in super, super early. They live like both both live in Denmark, and they were developing the site for maybe like ten years or eight years until Peter came in, which is the kind of the stats guy. They know him. he's mostly known as the stats guy right now in mm -hmm. in CS. Uh, he's a Serbian guy and became a co owner like after. A couple of years that he was working in working for the company he was doing like uh, the same as everyone at the time if you if you come in super early you're gonna do everything he was doing writing he was doing stats he was helping like implement new features figure out like the rating and stuff like that uh so yeah he came in as well and that those are the three main people be behind the site mm -hmm. um so about your editor position uh, do you think that your previous experiences helped you like from the projects in Croatia and similar? Yeah, I mean, I, at the, like, I still don't know why exactly I got the job. Like, no one actually told me like, oh, this is why you got the job. And I think no one, no one can actually point to one thing and say, oh, you did this and this is why we hired you. Uh, but I think when you, when you send a CV and you can see like my CV at the time is like, CS Adria, and then I did like, okay, I did writing, I did social media, I did casting, I did uh, cup administrating, I did like land organizing. I, then you look at the whole list of this and you, you can see that a person is motivated to do things in this field. Yeah. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to me, mean that this guy is going to be good at this specific job, but at least he has the drive to, to do things. And I think with where esports is right now, that is enough to get you into the door and People, for people to give you a chance. Mm -hmm. So I think that is what people saw. And I, except, yeah, I did 
the editor position at the CSADRIA and I try to like teach new people how to how to do stuff, even though like I've never actually been trained up to that point. I had some experiences from from other from other uh, news outlets that I worked uh, parallel, which was the gamer.hr site as well, where I actually learned a lot uh, from the editor that was there at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I did some work for eFrag as well, the legendary company that <laughs> people within CS know as uh, never paid out the uh, prize pools for like a $250,000 event and uh, other great stories. Uh, yeah. but, but at least, yeah, I'm, I'm not owed anything. I did not get uh, uh, screwed over by, by those guys, but I also did not get, get anything from them. I, all, all I got was just an opportunity to write in English, which I think was also a pretty good thing because just like, I think having a couple of articles published in English was a good, pretty good thing for yeah. getting a job at April TV so they can actually see, okay, there is some work that was published and some people read it and people commented about it that I didn't get any shit for it. So uh, it's, Fair enough. it's okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I think, I think it definitely helped. Like there is no other way to, to get into like a decent esports job without doing some voluntary free work or even like what we did in the beginning, the tournaments we organized, it's not even free. It's just like, you're actually losing money by yeah. doing these events. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, definitely. But the experience is uh, worth it. It's all about the experience. So your current job description is senior writer. What does that mean in HLTV? It means I'm a super cool guy, okay. and I have a, co a couple of a couple of like new people that come in. You you're free to like bully them and uh, oh, that's tell them nice. that they don't know what they're doing. So yeah. th that is kind of what it entails. And also, you, you get more money than being like a junior writer, which mm -hmm. is also nice. So I think those are the two main key points uh, about my job now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in, in, in the reality, like a day to day, uh, I, I work remotely as most of the company does, like 95%. Uh, everyone works from home, uh, goes to events. So normal day like this, I wake up whenever, depending on the day, depending on what I have to have to do. Uh, and then just like you scour through news, you see what's going on in the world, or maybe you have a feature article lined up or you have some things that you want to work it work on. So you're doing research, you're talking to people, you're conducting interviews, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, and just like being on top of everything that's going on in CS, which is kind of hard from time to time because there's a lot there's, of stuff going on, right? There's a lot of a stuff lot. going on. Then then you have like tournaments going on from 9am to 9pm uh, or 10pm or one in the morning if there are delays and stuff like that. So that also takes a, either takes a toll on your like personal life or you're going to be just missing out on, on CS. And then you have to kind of figure out how to catch up on things because th there's no off time. Like you miss yeah. one tournament, uh, there's another one now. It's not like there's two weeks off so you can just like watch all of the matches you, you missed. Yeah. So yeah, but, but yeah, other than that, news daily news interviews articles features and then uh, going to events uh, on a like monthly probably like one once per month going to an event and doing stuff from an event yeah so you go to a lot of events uh technically i mean once per month for like a week per event yeah. approximately a week maybe even more like that, that's a lot of time like away from home just doing your job and that's only the part of your job, right? So you got yeah. all the other stuff going on. You probably write some other articles from the events uh, th themselves and, I don't know, manage your guys that are under you and uh, read their articles and all that. But, okay, uh, when it comes to events, uh, could you give us your best and worst event so far? Like, from the uh, org uh, perspective or, like, fun perspective? Personal, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go from, from best. I think that is easiest. I think... Uh, one of the best events in CS overall is the ESL1 Cologne, mm -hmm. <laughs> Cologne event. Just because it is it is a big event in terms of people coming to it. It's like 15,000 people in the arena. It has some history in terms of it. it's been happening for a couple of years now. And then uh, from an organizational standpoint, ESL is, has been just leveling up every year. So everything goes very smoothly. Uh, there are no issues like the press room is not I mean it's actually not a nice press room but it's like it has everything inside that you need it has a press room <laughs> it has a it has a desk it has power and it has 
internet. So those mm -hmm. are the three things you would actually be surprised how often you don't have one of those three things in a press room. That is literally all you need. So mm -hmm. I had events where we did not have desks, where we had, we had to sit on a couch for like two days. We had like no, no internet. Uh, first day, no internet. That's a classic. Like half of the day, it doesn't work. There's no Wi-Fi or they don't give you the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> and then, of course, of course, not having power, that is like, yeah, we have some tables, we have internet. It's like, okay, can I have some power? No, we, there's like one plug over there on the other side of the room. So you're like, okay, I'll just work here. And then when I leave, I'll just put my laptop there to charge for like a couple of hours and hope no one steals it. Yeah, that's super nice. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a <laughs> whole other uh, like topic to go over, I guess, uh, all kinds of events. And But what about the worst event? Worst events, uh, there are a couple of very, I, I didn't have, I, I dodged most of these like super horror show events, which were like the gaming paradise and stuff <laughs> like that. So, and the first DWC in Belgrade is also pretty, pretty shit. All of the, all like in a four mile drive from, from Zagreb, which is also cool, like just in our region. But at the, like events where I had a weird experience or it was just kind of, I don't know. Uh, there's one event in Abu Dhabi and there is this event in, uh, in China and both not even that much about the event. I think the events were kind of okay. There were issues, but this event in China was, wasn't in Shanghai, wasn't in Beijing. It was in Haikou, which is a island in the, in the south of China. And it wasn't even in the main part of, of that island. It was just like some, around the convention center there were a couple of hotels and then you go there it's china so no one speaks english uh you can't use internet anywhere uber doesn't work uh credit cards don't work <laughs> so from that perspective and everything's empty there's like one shop and everything else there are, i don't know hundreds of buildings which don't have any people inside it's, it's just a super weird place we get there and <laughs> there's nothing to do like you can't get you get food of course getting food is also a nightmare not because i'm fine with asian food but like asian food in europe is not asian food in asia yeah they, yeah. they do like we do like our versions of their food it's like kind Obviously, of normalized yeah. you know and then you get you order stuff there you don't know even what you ordered like on the picture it looks nice then you get it and you see it, it is the same thing but you say <laughs> yeah I, I can't eat this this, this is awful <laughs> uh... So like, stuff like that, when everything adds up, like I went to, there's one ATM that I could get cash out of because you can't use cards, you need cash. That ATM was at the airport, which is like an hour Uber, not an Uber, a taxi away. Mm -hmm. So I went there for, for like the last day because I had to stay an extra day because there are no flights for, for me to go back. Long story. So I, I was there an extra day when everyone who was doing the event left. So it was just me that speaks English in the whole city. That was <laughs> super good. So I, the, the last day when everyone else was going, I went with my colleague to the airport to get some extra cash. And I wanted to get back and I or go through the, like the taxi ordering service on the, on the airport. And I'm like, does this person know where he needs to go? Does he know English? He doesn't know English, but like they gave him the address and he's like, okay, super, super cool. I could get into, into the cab and we could drive like, I don't know, like a mile. It's like a half an hour drive. Halfway through, he starts like asking me directions, like like pointing this way, that way. I'm like, <laughs> how, how do I know? I, I have no idea. It's the first time I've been here. It's like, follow, follow the signs. I gave him the address. He's like, Ooh, something. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting lost here. I, I'm going to end up who knows where. I have no internet. I, have, I just have the address. I mean, I, somehow I'll find a way back, but like, I have no idea how. And he constantly is like, for 15 minutes, like uh, trying to talk to me. Like, I can speak Chinese. He can speak English. He certainly can't speak Croatian, so <laughs> that also is off the table. But after like 45 minutes, we kind of we managed to find our way back. I'm like, fuck this place. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> so yeah, just uh, being in China is difficult with uh, all of these things we're used to nowadays with like uh, free internet everywhere, uh, Uber, uh, credit cards. Like now nowadays when I travel, it's like almost the same as being here in my neighborhood. Like you Uber wherever you want. You don't need yeah. to know any any streets, you don't need to know any location, you don't need to know the language because everyone speaks at least a bit of English. You don't need to get cash almost ever, except maybe in Germany in certain places because they're kind of old fashioned in that way. Uh, so yeah, you, you get super used to all of these comfort things and then you go into China and then yeah. it's like, 
especially not like a big city in China, just like some random place in China. That's kind of a weird, weird awakening, I feel like. Yeah, I guess all the European events, you always feel like you're almost home because yeah. everything works the same way and everyone knows English or at least maybe you know that other language, German, yeah. Italian, whatever. Um, it's a little bit different when you go to an A because it's, you know, it's a different world. It, things work in a different way. But if you're in Germany, if you're in Sweden, it, it really isn't, you know, yeah that yeah. foreign to except that it's cold and so bitch about that but other than that like most of the cultural things are are the same yeah 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 so how does your work look like on events when you're in your press room what do you do well it depends on like event to event but it is mostly mostly like interview based uh, at events because most of the other things you can you can pick it up from home. So people that are home working remotely, uh, they can pick up like classic news that are like result based stuff. So when you're at the event, it's mostly about getting in touch with players, talking about post matches or talking about general things that happen, uh, which can be from time from time to time. There is not much going on. It's mostly just about the games. But most of the time it is there is always some like overarching story about every team like there is maybe this player is looking to retire maybe someone there is a like a rumor posted about this player going to this team so you kind of try to get more information on that or a new player comes into a team so mm -hmm. how how is he fit, fitting in so stuff like that that you try to kind of figure out and then at the same time just building relationships with people in these like small ways even if you're not doing an interview you can talk to someone see what is going on maybe build a build a good like rapport with him so you can set up an interview later get some information get some insight into the team so you can maybe understand why this team is doing this move why they're approaching stuff on this way and then yeah so it's a lot of just like social aspect and talking to people and then of course watching the games as well which can be kind of hard when you when ever everything is going on at the same time yeah because you still need to see the games, see what's going on to analyze and have like good questions prepared. Otherwise, it's just going to be asking like the classic, how do you feel? What happened that game? And which, uh, look, we, we all do it from time to time, use some like filler, dumb questions. Uh, people can like, get upset about it. But I like at some some points, they are useful as well. Yeah. But yeah, it's not, it's not the way to like move forward to ask just like generic questions all the time. Yeah. Uh, but you're also always on a deadline, right? When you're writing articles, they have to come out that day or next day. Yeah, yeah. the way we do it is like we want to every, I mean, not every article, but most of the time when you're at an event and you're doing like a post-match interview, it doesn't make sense to leave it to just hang for like until tomorrow because that post-match doesn't even matter. Maybe maybe they played another game in the in the, in the meanwhile. Uh, so So it doesn't really make that much sense. So... It is kind of a fast-paced thing that you could kind of want to grab the player as soon as possible, get it, get an interview, sit down, transcribe it, uh, post it. Since like senior writers as me, we don't have. I mean, people do check our stuff, but we write it down and release it instantly. We we don't put it in the pipeline as maybe some other websites do or some other people do. Uh, it is just like on you to get it done and be sure that you didn't fuck up anything make a, like a typo in the headline or do some like stupid things that happen when you try to do things quickly it's all on you to get it done and put it out as soon as possible and like pick the title and see like, because titles are of course everything but no one reads anything anymore so yeah. you have to pick a great title and that is also a thing that you could you can spend like hours I don't, probably for you when you upload like youtube videos and stuff like that you can spend 45 minutes making the video and then five hours picking a title that that is going to be the best That'd be a nice so, clickbaity quote that isn't too yeah, clickbaity but it's yeah, you know that, true but it's a, also like only half of the story and stuff like that yeah. it's a, it's i mean you can't put everything you can't put everything in it but at the same time kind of can because i mean in hltv at least we, we're not a site that is driven by like reddit clicks or, or clicks yeah. in general because we have a pretty pretty big reader base but at the same time you want people to go into the article and read it and get some information that they didn't have before otherwise like what's the point yeah <laughs> as we say like water is wet uh, quotes are, are 
it's dumb. Like, what is the yeah. point? Why, why did you even put in all of the time to have some quote that's not interesting in the headline and no one's going to read everything else? Yeah, so it's yeah. kind of a waste of a time. So when you're on events, you always do only articles and no like video interviews? Uh, we, we did do, uh, there was, there was this period, I think like until 2016 or 17, where we used to do a lot of video interviews and a lot of videos in general. Uh, I think, I think we just understood that people on our site prefer text to videos, but at the time, like when I go to events, I always carry like the tripod and all the audio equipment to record video interviews. And we have a photographer, uh, with us at all times, so we can do the the actual video, but it's just, uh, sometimes it's much easier to do text interviews in terms of, uh, in terms of getting people to talk. I think a lot of people are just, uh, more open when there's no camera there. So, mm -hmm. uh, my experience has been that, that that's the better way to, to get more interesting information. Uh, and our readership just enjoys the ability to go quickly through the article and find what they want instead of maybe have to, having to watch a whole five minute or 10 minute video. Even if you try to skip through, you can't really know what you skip through. Yeah. Uh, when, when you go through text, it's, uh, it's much easier. You can control find and, and whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that's why we kind of pivoted towards, uh, towards text, uh, a couple of years ago. And it's, I think it also kind of has something to do with overall YouTube and, and CS, uh, changing like, like at the beginning, the beginning of CS, I think YouTube was super good for frag movies for highlight clips and and stuff in general uh youtube changing their algorithm with all of this non-violence uh things and that that kind of yeah. killed off a lot of the a lot of the reach that are because if you look back to like 2015 you can see our like yearly yearly compilations have like millions of views yeah they don't have like half of that nowadays so and it's not about like the quality going off it, it is it is youtube's algorithms changing and also like all of this twitch clips odd shots and other things that and also like production of events like before if you watched an event there weren't even like in 2013 there weren't replays of, of live live things so if and especially like off camera replays and nowadays there they have like I don't know how many people works on an ESL event uh, production, capturing replays of like every angle, and then of course, and posting that all of that onto Twitter, Facebook, posting that on people clip it and put it on Reddit. So it's people just see all of the frags. Yeah, all they the, already all catch the, the action on stream, on live, everything, yeah. and yeah, I understand that. So yeah, yeah. so th then that is the kind of the reason why just like clips in general are not that, and so we kind of also moved uh, away. I think. Not many people do CS video interviews in general. Like mm -hmm. it's not like we have some competition that does that, and they're like, "Yeah, maybe you should do it." Like everyone just kind of moved away. Maybe they do a couple of here and there, but it's just not a big thing uh, at the moment. All right, I I like what you said about people being a bit more relaxed when they're not on camera and they can talk about whatever at their own pace and uh, with no stress. So uh, yeah, there's there's something to it for sure. Uh, what do you think is your best article and uh, why do you think it's your best? Uh, this is a hard question, but just um, there are a couple of them that come to mind like instantly, which I was when I when they came out, I was happy or maybe not when they came out, maybe some when I went back and and read them. Uh, one was the the we have this top 20 players of the year thing that we mm -hmm. do uh, every year. Uh, so it starts January 1st, it's going to start January 1st again, uh, where we just list from number 20 to number one, the best players of the world for this year. And every, every like announcement goes with a big article about the player's career, the history, and then this year specifically and integrated in that are like questions and interview with that player. So it's a very kind of in-depth article, like I don't know, three to five to six thousand words, depending on on who who read who writes it and uh, what year, what player. And I did uh, in two thousand. That was start of two thousand seventeen or eighteen when Nico finished. I don't know. I don't remember the actual number, but it was his first top twenty. He was still playing in mouse sports. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a player from this region, and it's like it was a super interesting story to me personally because it kind of integrated like regional stuff into this international scene 
and was a big thing for for him as well. Uh, so the article that I did on that, when I went back and read it, I was like, I was I was super inspired when I was when I was writing this. I, you can see that I was I really wanted to do this, and uh, that that is something that nowadays when you do so many articles, you can't be that hyped about about a single thing. So th that was the, when I go back to that, I, I'm pretty happy with uh, how that turned out. Yeah, that that's a good one. All right, so tell us uh, quickly a little bit about HLTV confirmed. What that is. Yeah, so uh, I think that was also last year we started this. Uh, it started as a sh Twitch show thing that we we got a new person coming in who has experience in like radio and stuff like that uh, coming into HLTV to try to do some like specific content. It started as a like a show episode, something like you could watch on Netflix, like a half an hour, forty five minute thing that in integrated different like news, but also like interviews and then breakdowns and stuff like that. But the way uh, it, it just didn't fit what what people want from content uh, nowadays. So we pivoted to like a live show, which started mostly as just a basic podcast. But then we kind of added more segments and more fun things to it to make it feel more like something you could see like a like a late night show thing, but but about CS. Uh, of course, it's not. It's uh, still like a Skype show. It's not a real studio setup, which is, doesn't exist in CS at the moment, uh, and just because it's super expensive. Yeah. But but yeah, it is. It's a podcast style show with uh, a couple of people. It's me and uh, Striker, who's my colleague from HLTV, and then uh, Sponge, who's uh, probably the best analyst uh, in CS right now. Uh, and then we get like guests in, which are players, maybe coaches, maybe other people from the scene. And then we kind of try to recap like news and uh, give some like interesting insight into into things. And I think what we really try to do with the show is get into arguments as much as possible, mm -hmm. because a lot of these shows and podcasts, they have maybe a stale combination of people that they just agree on everything. And even if they don't agree, they agree to disagree, which I also feel is not that interesting, not that funny and not people need to be challenging each other's ideas in general. Uh, and I feel like in in esports in general, there's a lot of just like too much respect between people that people like someone says something and no one wants to go against that. And that becomes the truth, even if it's not the truth, just because someone with enough reputation said something. And yeah, uh, that is something we try to not have uh, as much. We just try, like, whoever says whatever, someone is going to be trying to take another angle and uh, kind of see, is this really the thing? And if, you, if you're able to defend your point, then, yeah, it makes sense. If not, then maybe you're talking out of your ass, which people yeah. do often. So where can we watch the show? Uh, it's twitch.tv slash HLTV org. So the HLTV is Twitch channel. Uh, and there's a Twitter account, HLTV confirmed, uh, which if you want to be informed on it, I think that's the, the best place to, to go. All right. Good stuff. You also had some pros lately in the show, right? Yeah. Uh, the last, uh, we had JW from Fnatic, uh, three time major winner, uh, major MVP, top 20 player of like three years. So, and just in general, a super, super cool guy and a very like meme, likes the meme, likes to make fun of everything and, and is super exciting to watch as well, is yeah. one of those players, which uh, uh, when he stops playing, everyone's going to miss uh, his style because he brings like some uh, bullshit plays, uh, as people like to call it, mm -hmm. the fanatic bullshit. Yeah. So yeah, Config, other people, NBK was there, uh, Get Right, uh, like some of the best uh, names in CS were, were in the show. Yeah, it's very cool that you can get those guys in and uh, they, they enjoy participating. It's in not, I'll tell you, it's not easy. It's not it's easy not? to get anyone on it. I mean, you probably know just trying to get people on a, on a show like this. But since that is a live show going on Twitch where you have to have like a set deadline, you have to go now. It's, it can be like 8.15, can be like 8.20. If it's 8, it has to be 8, maybe yeah. 8, 8.05. But getting people to commit to a schedule like that, and then you you need to announce it all in advance because otherwise yeah. people won't won't see it. Uh, it's uh, it's a pretty difficult thing. Like everyone's gonna say like, oh yeah, maybe let me check, and then like <laughs> wait for five days. And like let okay, me talk to my check? agent. Yeah, <laughs> check. yeah, sounds good. But I need to talk to my org. 
And yeah. it was like, okay. And yeah, stuff like that happens all the time. And it's, uh, it's hard, it's frustrating, but it's, uh, it's how it is. It's part of the job. All right, so for someone that is mostly invested into CS and basically not much else, right? Um, what do you think of PUBG as an esport? And what do you think are the main problems in BR or PUBG esports in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I did not even play any of the I'm see, I mean, the, the BR. I think I opened up Fortnite for like five, ten minutes, and it was fun for ten minutes. And then the sixth, the like twelfth minute, I, I was super bored by it, and went back to CS, as I do with all of the games nowadays. But uh, I watched uh, a bit of PUBG. I watched you when you play, and I think what as a streamer game, it seems super good, and it's. I think even even as an esport, it's more understandable than a lot of other games like like the league of legends and the dotas if you if you're not into those games like super mm -hmm. deep it's hard to understand what is going on so i think from a like a baseline perspective it's not it's not that bad but obviously there are issues with so much stuff going on on the map at the same time and so many teams and then how do you know what's what's actually like what is actually important that is going yeah. on, on on the map right now so things like that, like in CS, that is super streamlined. There is a couple of people. There are these these angles, this map. You know which map suits which which team more. You have a lot of data on that. Which who play, which player plays on which position. It's it's more easy to to get into it. And I think on in PUBG and BR games, there's a lot of randomness as well, which I think is uh, not great and uh, not not just like not esports oriented the more mm -hmm. randomness you have the less esports oriented you you actually are i think that's pretty pretty like normal conclusion to, to have yeah i think I don't, I don't know that much about like pubg's issues but aside from like bugs and maybe just like it being a super big game in terms of how many people you have to have on a stage or where wherever from a logistics standpoint i think that's a nightmare mm -hmm. so i'm not sure that 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 it even should be like a land competitive game when you have like that many people necessary to be in one place and then all of these issues with the game clients and updates and then land and not land i don't know like talking about fortnite though that's a game which obviously does not want to even be an esports they just want the publicity of they just want to make a show people. yeah yeah they, they just want to make it they, they literally did say multiple times like we do not care about adding new, I don't know, new items into the game a couple of days before a major event. So if, if that's your standpoint, then you obviously don't care about people yeah. practicing and people actually like figuring out maybe this problem, this is a super broken item, which can break the game. Like, I don't know, the stupid mechs and stuff, stuff that they added. I don't know. I'm not super in depth, but you can see that things don't really, don't really work the way they should. So they exist as an esport just because like it's a big game so people automatically will want to compete so that is an esport right that's a base of an esport and there's a lot of money as well but is the is the is it uh, esport and the nature of the game then I, I would say no right so at least PUBG is kind of they want to do something in that direction so that mm -hmm. that's a that's a good start but at the same time it's so far away in terms of everything else that needs to be built up yeah so what are your thoughts on Project A that is coming up from Riot Games? That is, that, that, that was a big talking point when the trailer dropped, which is still the only, not even a trailer, it's just a video announcement thing that they, they dropped in CS. Uh, I mean, in CS people are, even though the, the game is successful, I think it's very successful considering how, how long it's out. And me personally, I think the game is in a, very good place in terms of net code in terms of uh, bugs and th there's not a lot of issues with the game in general people are still always frustrated and always want more and always want other things and i think it's like and to a degree valve could could be better and could step up in some ways and i think since this announcement came out that they actually it feels like they started doing more things than they were doing doing before and valve does have this uh, I don't know, reputation of being kind of a lazy company and not, except for Dota, where, where they do a lot of Obviously, things and they're yeah. <laughs> super hands-on. Uh, so yeah, what I want to say that people in, C in the CS community are always frustrated. So when this announcement came out, everyone was like, 
oh, this is this is great. Like this is uh, this is going to be the next thing. Uh, I'm going to move to this game or I don't know, just like the, everyone's super hyped because they like FPS games. Maybe they can play it on their free time. Maybe they're going to be going there to do pro stuff. Maybe they're going to do. But there's a lot of hype in the in the CS community about Project A. Even I think like too much uh, positive uh, push from like the top CS players for the game that did not came did not go out. We only have like very small information. Two minutes. Yes, of a video, I think it's two minutes long or something. That's like a, they say a couple of things, like "Oh, we want to annihilate uh, Peter's advantage." And I was like, "Oh, this is so good. They know everything. They're so good." Like, okay, uh, but yeah, people are promoting a game that is uh, eventually going to be a competitor to CS in some degree, and you are a CS pro that lives off of CS and people playing CS. In a way, by promoting this game, you're working against yourself, right? This is your livelihood. I mean. Okay, teams and players that are not on the top ten, okay, they can go to a, a different game. But people like I don't know that are currently a top three team in the world, they're they're not gonna switch to Project A when it comes out. Like they're gonna be a CS pro until they retire. It's not gonna very unlikely that they're gonna be switching to another esports at the, at this point. So yeah. you I guess the you same happened with PUBG, right? No CS pro switched to PUBG except Shroud, if you can count that. But he went into the <laughs> streaming world, so. It's obviously a different thing, but not a single CS, high-level CS pro, except maybe some, like, tier 3 players. Uh, nobody even tried. There are a couple of those, thai, thai, I think, Thai players, like, I don't know, this is Cigarettes or some of those players that I saw a couple of them, and maybe some, like, CIS players, but, like, low tier, very low tier. It's the it's same, same thing with Overwatch as well. I think a couple of them swapped just because they were banned in CS, which is, like, C, <laughs> Lazy K, and those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then Steele was hating every second of it, but at least he was like doing something, and now he's back in CS again. Yeah. So, yeah, m yeah. Maybe ten years from now, Project A is the main FPS, and CS doesn't exist. Maybe in that case, they can they some people switch over, but other than that, you're like you're just promoting a rival company, which is in some way or other or the other going to be taking money out of your pocket. But okay. Oh, but, but yeah, maybe... for me, for, yeah. Okay, good ask. Uh, maybe they can coexist. Maybe I mean they can coexist. There, yeah. there's literally there is a space for another FPS. Yeah. But even if they coexist, one is gonna like the new game coming in is gonna take some market share from CS. Sure, you it, it can it cannot be any other way. Yeah, but sure. I think the game the game as the, as what they showed it looked kind of okay. It looked I like just like that the mechanics feel like. Felt kind of stiff. It doesn't feel like you're floating around in the in the air with like Overwatch movement. Like it yeah, seems yeah. the movement seems a lot more like like CS when and then they added these like abilities things and stuff that I, I don't know how how it's gonna feel when you go into the game. What do you think of uh, Riot Games as a company? Is that a good thing that they're doing the game out of all the companies out there? I think it's it's a perfect like like anti yin yang thing with with valve like riot and valve are completely opposing companies in the way they do things and especially with cs which is super open you can do whatever you want just like don't do like super bad shit and we won't you you won't even hear about us and that's yeah. that's like valve stance and then riot is we control everything so if anything if the games are kind of similar if it comes to this what you mentioned that that they coexist and then CS remains doing what they do now, which is open circuit, different tournament organizers, uh, no franchising, stuff like that. And then Riot comes in with Project A and does everything their way that they did with uh, League of Legends or like similar fashion, mm -hmm. which regionalized leagues and then uh, franchises and maybe a couple of big international events where in CS it's international event every other week. That I think it would be very nice to see how, how those two work and which gets more traction, which gets more viewership. I think that is uh, that would be actually cool. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, but it's pretty obvious that they're going to throw in a lot of money into the game and yeah. into esports, and they want to make the game esport first. And that's something you don't hear every day from, from basically anyone anymore because no one wants to make an esport game. It's, it's very high risk and low reward overall. It's not know what the casuals like so we're gonna yeah. have to sit and wait and see what their actual plan is with the game i guess
Yeah. All right. So uh, one more thing. You're very active on Twitter, and you've been active on Twitter for quite a while. And you know, a little bit of drama here and there. You know, a little bit of teasing people and uh, making fun of people, and you know, asking the questions no one wants to ask. So. How important do you think that is in your career? Maybe not now, but in the future. How important do you think that's going to be? I think it's uh, for my job specifically. I think it's very important, just because the way Twitter works is just even all of the other things aside. Uh, the thing that to DM someone, he needs to follow you. That that aspect is is just super big. Like you need to be if like a pro player follows you, you can DM him, you can get information from him. And that's, yeah, 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 yeah. that's very important. <clears throat> and then to get, uh, to get people to follow, you can't be like a 50 follower account. It doesn't matter w- what article you write. If someone sees you have 50 followers, like it's unlikely that he's going to follow you. So you have to like start grinding and start from somewhere, get to like a thousand followers. And then people can say, oh, they come up to your account. They say, oh, okay, this guy is someone. And then maybe if they like what you read, like what you write, they can follow you and then you can get in touch with them. And that's a kind of a good thing for you as in my career specifically, right? So, so you're building your brand through Twitter. I mean, it's, yeah, it has to be important. Um, how many pros follow you, if you know? I just got simple follow me the, <laughs> like two days ago. And that was a big, like, I don't really care. Like n- nowadays, like all, all, like most of them follow me, which is nice. And mostly, I don't care. Like, oh, Kenny has followed me. Oh, okay, cool. But like simple follows, maybe like 200, 300 people. And I saw like simple follows. I'm like this. Yeah. This. <laughs> yeah. This is it. I made yeah. it. I made it. I made it. I made it. I made it. <laughs> Screenshot posting to, to mom. I like say followed me. Is like who the fuck is this guy? Is like just the best player in CS. Like, yeah. Okay. But yeah, so a lot of them follow me and you get to interact, you get to like build your brand, not to even build your brand, just like build your relationship with these people, which even from not a business standpoint, just like as a human being, you kind of want to interact and, and see what's going on. And I think that's cool. And I, I really like to, to shit post. That's what I've always been like, as I said, like from the forums and like 10, 15 years ago, talking shit, uh, getting into Twitter arguments. Uh, annoying people posting things <laughs> that people don't want to be like don't don't like and uh that's uh very enjoyable for me i don't know that that's just always someone something that i always enjoyed even before when i had like some shit posting twitter where i posted on in creation like before cs or anything <laughs> it's just always a fun thing to do to annoy people yeah so what would you recommend for someone that wants to get into esports maybe into writing how how do you start um this is a question i get a lot actually like in dms and uh, stuff like that people ask me oh how did you get the job how did you get how did you do this how did you do that it's i mean i think my path is not that unique or special i just think anyone could have done it what i did but no one did and that's that's a difference so when what i say to people is just like start doing something anything just like get some experience and figure out what you want to do and it doesn't even matter if you're if you're not sure like if this is a thing or maybe you're not that interested in this maybe you want this other thing but they're offering you this thing at least take that thing and try to do something there and then maybe maybe you want to write articles but you get offered like a social media position take the social media position start writing and then maybe you can show them some other things that you that you want to write maybe there's an op- opening or something mm-hmm. so you move to this and just get more experience so i think what i said to a lot of people but almost no one listened to me uh, just like start just message everyone message all of these like tier 3 esports sites which n- maybe have 100 people read their article just like get out there and get something published and get some feedback and start that way so I think that that is the the best way to get go about it. All right, perfect, man. Thank you for this interview. I think we covered a lot of great topics, and it might even help someone. You never know. You never know. Yeah. I mean, there is one guy that actually listened to me and is now doing like a lot of stuff in the in the region, uh, El Gancho. So shout out mm-hmm. to him. Actually, actually did something. That, that's <laughs> I, I feel like, yeah, this guy, this guy listened. This guy is 
This is it. Now he's going to say that he made it because you mentioned him. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you, Matt. And I'll catch you on another episode. I, we're going to do more, 100%. So pleasure having you here, dude. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning in today. If you made it to this part, please support the show by leaving an honest review on your favorite podcasting platform. We're trying to get the final face out there to new listeners, and that's arguably the best way to do it. Feel free to support the show uh, via Patreon on patreon.com slash and I'll see you in the next one.